Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I have a fun episode for you today. We're going to be comparing the beliefs of Kenneth Copeland, who's better known as a prosperity preacher, with Richard Rohr, who is incredibly influential in progressive Christianity. I'm excited to get into that. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Impact 360 Institute. Go to Impact 360.org. Use the code podcast for $50 off and learn all about the life-changing experiences that they put on for students. Okay, before I get into today's episode, I want to do a couple of announcements here. We are less than a week away from our Unshaken Conference in Chino Hills at Southern California. So all my Southern California friends would love to see you come out for the Unshaken Conference where Frank Turek, Natasha Crane, and myself are going to be equipping you to live your Christian Christian faith boldly in this incredibly chaotic culture. We've already done one uh, conference in Dayton, Ohio. It was so sweet. It was wonderful. We're looking forward to Chino Hills. We're also going to be in Nashville and Tucson. Tucson is September 23rd and Nashville is November 4th. Tickets for all of those dates are on sale and there's actually still some early bird tickets avail- available for Tucson and for Nashville. So I'd love to see you come out uh, to one of those conferences. Also, really want to ask you guys, if you are a regular listener to, of this podcast and you get a lot out of the content that we produce and that we put out, it would help us out so much if you go to wherever it is that you're listening to this and rate and review. Uh, you've all done such a great job of having some great reviews on Apple and all the places. It just helps fine tune those ag- algorithms to get the uh, podcast material out to more people. And of course, subscribing. If you're uh, somebody who's more visual, you want to watch it on YouTube, subscribe. And then you also have to click that bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. And you're not going to want to miss some of the great episodes that we have coming up next week. It's going to be with David Geisler, who is the son of Norman Geisler, who is one of my, I guess you could say my intellectual heroes. He went to be with the Lord back in 2019. But when I was in my faith crisis, it was the scholarship of Norm Geisler that was so influential. Of course, he founded SES, who's also a sponsor of this podcast and helped shepherd me, the SES uh, professor helped shepherd me through my faith crisis, and now I'm a student there. So I don't want you to miss that episode because we're going to be talking through the 12 points that prove Christianity true. And I realized I can't believe I've had the podcast as long as I have, and I have never done an episode just building that really basic classical apologetics case for uh, the existence of God and the truthfulness of Christianity and the reliability of the Bible. How have I not done that on this podcast yet? But we're going to be doing that next week with Norm's son, Dave. David. And David just does a great job with all of that. We also talk about the interaction of faith and reason. Can people be argued into Christianity? How much of our intellect is involved versus our heart? And then how does faith play into all of that? So we uh, just had a fantastic discussion about all of that. So subscribe, rate, review, and don't miss any of these great episodes that we have coming up. We've also got Dr. Everett Piper coming up where we talk about safe spaces on college campuses and why he's so critical of that. We talk about his book, Not a Daycare. Of course, as a college president, he uh, wrote a viral article basically saying, hey, we don't exist here to be a daycare. This is not why we're here. This isn't a safe space. This is where you come and you learn and you are challenged. So great couple episodes coming up for you. Okay, without any further ado, I want to tell you about what you're about to listen to. So I invited my friend Andreas Viget all the way from Switzerland to talk with me about his expertise in the theology of Kenneth Copeland. And what we were actually connected by Brandon, who is the director of the American Gospel Movies. And I was so surprised to learn that actually Kenneth Copeland and Richard Rohr have quite a bit in common when it comes to their view of creation, which whether – I'm not actually sure. I forgot to ask Andreas this, if Kenneth Copeland would actually – probably he wouldn't claim to be a panentheist, but that's in essence what he's teaching – And you almost can't tell the difference between some quotes of Kenneth Copeland and those of Richard Rohr. So we talked through all of that. But some highlights for me from today's episode are when we talked through just the very basic 
uh, theological principles of classical theism. Now, if that kind of sounds like intellectual heady stuff, I can assure you that it is very exciting because when you think about classical theism, it really will refute so many heretical ideas that will come down the pike. So it's just a short little section where we give a little primer on that and some of the attributes of God, very valuable stuff there. And then we get into the panentheism of Kenneth Copeland and Richard Rohr. And a couple of other highlights for me in this episode was when Andreas shared with us the implications of these views and where they lead and how really how progressive Christianity and the prosperity gospel sort of have a touching point. And I didn't, I I always kind of felt like maybe they were two sides of the same coin, but we were able to unpack that a little bit more where we talk about it's really a lowered view of Scripture in the sense that both of those movements depend on a lot of extra biblical revelation. In other words, God just speaking to you in your heart every day and um, and degrading really the, the role of the Bible and biblical authority. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. It was just a fascinating conversation for me, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So without any further ado, here's Andreas Viget. Well, Andreas, I'm so glad that you've joined us. I've been really looking forward to this because I've long suspected that there is a connection between what is on the more hyper-charismatic NAR, word of Mm -hmm. faith type of movement, that there's a lot of connection between that and maybe what we see in progressive Christianity. So we might get to get to the bottom of some of that today, but let's just start by defining some terms. So we're going to talk primarily about panentheism, which is a particular view of creation. And we're specifically going to look at how panentheism is taught by two pretty famous religious figures that our audience might not realize have some things in common, of course, Richard Rohr and Kenneth Copeland. So panentheism is a belief that's growing in popularity. What exactly is it? And, you know, a lot of people have heard of pantheism. How is what is panentheism and how does it differ from pantheism? Yes, so most people are very familiar with the term pantheism, which means basically that all is God. Now, in the pantheistic worldview, you have basically only one reality that exists, and that's the natural world. There's nothing that goes beyond that. And yet this natural world has a divine quality. So all is God. All that exists, all of reality that exists is divine. Now, panentheism means that all is in God. Now, here you believe in a transcendent realm, right? So there is something that is beyond the natural realm that is God. And yet everything that exists in the universe is a part, literally a part of God's own essence, right? So it has a divine quality, a divine quality is given to the natural realm. And yet, God still exists as a separate entity, so to say. That's really the difference between the two. Yeah, and I've heard it described as if panentheism is like if you believe God created the universe, but then poured his spirit into created matter and filled it much like a hand fills a glove. And we have a little graphic here for those of you who are watching on uh, YouTube. Now, if you're listening on the audio platforms, you won't be able to see the graphics, so I'll describe it. On the left, pan- pantheism is a circle, and inside the circle are the words God equals the universe, right? Then in the middle, you have a longer oval, top to bottom, where you have inside the oval two circles, and inside is God and universe. And then finally, on the right, you have theism, which is uh, the belief, uh, you know, belief in God. So pan meaning all, n meaning in, theism, God. Uh, So on that far right, you have two circles where you have God on top with an arrow pointing to the other circle, which is universe. So in that far right circle, you have this separation where God is actually not a part of his creation. Uh, Andreas, what else would you add to that as we look at this graphic? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, Now, the theistic, the traditional theistic position, which we call classical theism or traditional theism, really sees uh, the universe and God as two separate things, two separate essences. They do not mix or intermingle in any way with each other. And yet God exists in every point in the universe, Yeah, just without mm-hmm. mixing those two essences. Uh, we also see that uh, the emphasis uh, basically on God's transcendence is higher right? Mm -hmm. But he's still imminent. He's still close. And we also realize that 
the universe uh, is dependent on God for its existence. Yeah, very good. So you mentioned a, a phrase, classical theism. So for, for mm -hmm. our audience, I will direct you back to uh, a podcast I did long before we even had a YouTube channel, and it was on a doctrine called divine simplicity. We're going to talk a little bit about divine simplicity yeah. today, which is a part of uh, classical theism that you just mentioned. Absolutely. So I'd love to just give our audience a quick primer. So for those listening, th this is a really important foundation for us to lay, because if we're going to talk about what's wrong with pantheism and panentheism, we have to understand what classical theism is. Now, one thing that is really important to, to understand is classical theism, what we're about to describe, is something that both Catholics and Protestants affirm. You can find it in the writings that's of right. uh, Augustine, uh, Aquinas. I mean, this is something that's been—it's uh, in four or five. It's in the Bel Belgic Confession, I believe, in the Westminster Absolutely. Confession. Absolutely, the Westminster— the 1689, yes. Yeah, so this this is something that's very, very foundational. In fact, um, I'm currently a student at Southern Evangelical Seminary, and one of the things that one of my professors was saying is that if you understand classical theism, it will guard you against yes. every heresy that could come about. So don't tune Absolutely. out for this, audience. This is really important. We're going to give you just a very basic little primer on classical mm -hmm. theism. So, Andreas, one of the foundational aspects of classical theism is what we call creation ex nihilo. Help yes. us understand what that means. So it basically means that creation happens out of nothing. So God creates matter where there is nothing before, right? So as him as the first cause of it. Mm -hmm. so and, and this is prime important. Mover. Yeah, prime mm -hmm. mover is, I think, uh, Aristotle, call, was it Aristotle that called yes. him, called it the prime mover. So in other words, the buck has to stop somewhere. Uh, so, yeah. so God, you know, a lot of people will say, well, who created God? Well, that's a category yeah. error because we're talking about a being that is, as we're going to get into, pure actuality, pure being itself yeah. is what God is. And so when yeah. we talk about him creating ex nihilo, we're talking about him creating the universe out of absolutely nothing. It's not like there was this other existing matter that existed alongside God for eternity. It was only God and he created yeah. All that we that exists out of absolutely nothing. So that's a really good foundational thing to understand. So, Andreas, what are some other aspects of classical theism that we need to be aware of? Yes, yeah, so certainly God's essence that is distinct from creation. Um, we believe that all of God's essence are the attributes. So they are um, so his essence are the totality of his perfections or his attributes. And many of those attributes we would consider as merely being able to exist in transcendence. So there is no analogy in creation itself. So if you think about the fact that um, God is eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, certain things like that, there is no analogy in creation whatsoever. So the, only God has those perfections. And even attributes such as, let's say, love, grace, righteousness, justice, that we can reflect to some degree, God has them perfectly. So he has all the perfections. So we cannot in no way reflect those things or act in, in such a way as he does. And this gives, of course, this very important creator creature distinctions that we need to have as the basis in our theology so when we study through those things what we are really doing is we are setting up a theo theology from the top down mm -hmm. we first define who god is so we're basically doing theology proper we want to understand his attributes his essence his being uh, the way he creates the way he relates to the universe we start there and only then we move to humanity and try to understand humanity in light of that and that helps us as you said to guard from heresy and to set up just a proper understanding basically about reality that's what we are doing we get a foundational understanding of what reality really is. 
Right. And that creator creation distinction is very mm -hmm. important uh, for people Absolutely. to understand because um, just some practical examples of where people might, you know, it might even just be ignorance. It might be that they're mm -hmm. just not aware of this. And so they're not meaning to communicate panentheism. But just for our audience, you know, some some ways people will talk about this is you might hear somebody say, well, I look for Jesus in everything and everyone. Well, that sounds good, yes. right? That sounds like a nice thing to say, that you're looking for Jesus. And, you know, I even wrote a song many, many years ago before I was really, you know, aware of all of these sort of categories. Mm -hmm. And I said something about, you know, looking for Jesus in a homeless guy. And I look back on that now and I just cringe because oh. I think I did not understand <laughs> the creature. Yeah you know, creation uh, distinction. And so this is a really important thing. So if you see, hear people say things like, um, well, you know, I, f I find God in nature. Well, it's one thing for God, you know, the, the, of course we know from Romans 1 that all that's been made, we can learn things about God's, uh, even his that's divine right. essence and his nature and his attributes, certain things from just looking at creation, right? That certainly is true, but we're not looking to find God in those created things. And, and this is where classical theism just starts. And I love the way you worded that, where classical theism starts with God. So we're building our theology from God down, top down. It's a God-centered right. theology. Yeah. And so yeah. let's, let's start there. Let's talk about some some attributes of God. So there are uh, attributes of God that we call communicable, meaning there are things that we can share in as well. Things like love. We, you know, humans can mm -hmm. can participate in love and understand justice and, and do justice mm -hmm. and mercy and things like this. Yeah. But then there's this category of attributes of God that we refer to as non-communicable, meaning they're they're they belong to God alone. And so let's let's That's talk right. about what some of those are because. Um, yeah. There's really so, a, a, example, an important distinction there. Um, aseity is an attribute only God has. So he exists out of necessity in and from himself. So he, ha he himself has no cause. He just exists. And we cannot say that about any creature at all, right? That's not a, a reality in our world and for us, but it's a reality for God. It's really an abstract concept. Our finite minds cannot even fully grasp that reality so and this is certainly an attribute only god has and it creates already a distinction between us and him mm -hmm. and then a key bible verse for that would be romans eleven thirty six, 36 which That's says right. for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever okay now i mentioned mm -hmm. earlier uh pure actuality this is getting a little philosophical mm -hmm. but you know we can do this guys this is an important thing to understand when i described god as being pure being or pure pure essence or pure actuality itself help us understand that one a little bit andreas yeah so it basically means that god is not acted upon and he is the first mover so uh, in contrast a human being has potency we can become some, something else, right, if something acts upon us. And that is not true of God. He is pure actuality. He is all that he is in his fullness, right? Yes. So and and I've, heard, um, I've heard my, yeah. some of my professors refer to it as God has no potential. <laughs> which sounds like yeah, that, <laughs> it sounds like a terrible thing to say, but it actually means that God there's no terrible, potential yeah. for God to yeah. change, right? He's just pure actuality. Let's say, um, you know, I right now I have the potential to hold up my hand in front of the camera. Now I haven't actualized that potential until it actually yes. happens, right? So my brain tells right. me. My hand to go raise. Now I've here. I've actualized yes. that potential, and for those who can't see, I've just put my hand up in front of the camera. So I've just actualized my potential to put my hand up. Exactly. Yeah. So God doesn't change, right? So He's pure actuality. There's no, um, you know, He's not He's not moved by something else to move. He just is yes. pure actuality. So yep. um, Exodus three fourteen, I am who I am, and John eight fifty eight, when Jesus says, "Before Abraham was, I am," uh, is a is a great passage that sort of explains. That. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about simplicity. And again, I've got a whole episode yes. on simplicity. It's very, very, this is such a key <laughs> doctrine, guys. So help us, Andreas. What is, were you talking about yeah, when we say God is again, he, simple? Yes. Here we find another key distinction between, between human beings and God. If you think about the human being, we consist out of organs and out of limbs. They're interdependent. 
maybe one part of us is more important than the other. So in God, you don't have these parts and differences. He is not a being that, that consists out of interdependent parts, like a human being. It's one essence. It's just one essence that is indivisible. That's really what it is. We are not talking about God being that God is a being that is simple to understand or, or anything <laughs> like that. It's about his indivisible essence, basically. Well, I want to tell you about our first sponsor today, and that is Impact 360 Institute. I absolutely love being a faculty teacher with Impact 360. I get to drive up to beautiful Pine Mountain, Georgia. The The premises, the grounds are just so beautiful. You're up in the mountains. They have state-of-the-art uh, accommodations. They have an amazing cafeteria. Some of the best salad bar I've ever had is at Impact 360. Um, not that that's why you should consider it, but it doesn't hurt, right? Uh, just state-of-the-art facilities, but not only that, they really care about the next generation and shaping leaders of the next generation. And they approach that from uh, apologetics, theology, discipleship. They help the students build community. They got several different options of experiences to choose from. They have a one-week experience called Propel. And that's a great starting point. If you have a young person in your life that is looking for a summer camp experience, something like that, Propel is a great introductory week into the ministry of Impact 360. Then there's a two-week experience called Immersion. Then they have a nine-month gap year program. This nine-month gap year program is absolutely amazing. I would recommend every student take a gap year between high school and college if you're going to go to college and go to Impact 360, become equipped to uh, engage the culture that you're going to be in when you go to various college campuses, and sadly, even Christian campuses can be really um, anti-biblical. I hate to say it, but it's it's true. So Impact 360 is a great resource to help equip your young person, your student. So go to impact360.org. You can use the code podcast to get $50 off. And I believe Immersion is already full for this year, but you can get on the waiting list. But I think Propel still has some spots open. So check it out, impact360.org. Use the code podcast. Right. So a lot of people make a mistake here with this category when they might pit God's love against his justice. And they might say, well, God is part love and part justice. That would be a mistake mm -hmm. because God is not like part of him is love and then part of him is justice. Yes. And we have to figure out how those things fit together. God is all, he is love itself. He is justice itself. There's no division between those things. And so we Absolutely. have words to describe love and justice because we're describing the character and nature of God that is not divided into parts. Of course, Deuteronomy 6, 2, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, right? Talk about mm -hmm. God's eternality. Yes. So um, God doesn't experience uh, a temporal succession as we do. Yeah, we, we perceive one moment after the other. That is not true of God. So he basically transcends time eternally, right? He transcends yeah. it. He's not dependent on it in his existence. And he perceives all of time, every moment, uh, past and future at the same moment, so to say. He perceives all of it at the same time. I, he I heard a good analogy to help us. I mean, and again, it's an analogy, and every analogy is going to yeah. break down at some point. I'm curious to see if you like this one, Andreas. But I heard somebody explain it like, you know, for us, when we talk about time, what we're really describing is change. We're describing the mm -hmm. change that happens. Like if I um, walk to the door and close the door and come back here— time will have passed, we're describing the change that happened from me going there and coming back. And for God, mm -hmm. as you said, he's experiencing all of that at once. And so um, I don't know if you like this analogy or not, but it would be as if I heard it described this way, as if um, you were hovering way up above uh, like the Macy's Day Parade, and you're, you can see the front and the end of it, and it's all happening mm -hmm. at the same time. But for the person down on the ground, they're just seeing one float go by. So for them, mm -hmm. that change is marked differently than it is for you. Do you like that example, or do you think it breaks down? Um, probably at some point, every human analogy can break down, but uh, overall, I think it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it helps to make sense of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Because it is these are difficult concepts to wrap our heads around. Absolutely. And of course, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8 says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years mm -hmm. and a thousand years is like one day. All right, immutability. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about there? 
So we are really talking about God's unchanging nature. So he does not, within his essence, change. He does not improve or decrease in his holiness. He does not learn new information. So it's all already there and it's complete and it's perfect. So that within his essence, there are really no changes. We can even talk about his unchanging nature regarding his promises. So they're basically really fixed and no external force is going to change it or give him new information. There are no learning processes. He has all of his knowledge and that stays like that. Yes. And uh, I'll recommend uh, a pot because I know a lot of people are probably thinking, well, what about the Bible verses where it says God, you know, he relented or repented or changed his mind? I want to refer everybody back to an episode with Dr. Richard Howe, a seminary professor answers your toughest questions about God. Somebody asked that question and Dr. Howe gave such a wonderful answer to that. So go back and listen to that. But of course, Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change, which also that passage really applies to God's impassibility as well. So what are we talking about when we talk about his impassibility? Yeah, so God doesn't experience emotions as we do, right? So an external event doesn't cause him uh, to uh, suffer internally as we do to to sense that and and to uh, basically it's not stirring up his essence in such a way. Uh, He can perceive it as bad, obviously, but it does not affect his internal essence. As right. we experience emotions, right? Right. All right. What about his infinity? Now, again, we're talking about the non-communicable attributes of God. These are attributes that belong to God alone that we can't share in. I'm not omnipresent. I'm not infinite. I'm not et- eternal in the sense God is. So what are we talking about when we are talking about God's yes. infinity? Again, he's completely free from space and time. He has no limits and uh, he possesses an infinite superiority of all his essence. Yeah. Um, in, and in that sense, again, God is wholly different than, than we are. Yeah. First Kings 8.27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven in the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. All right, let's get through uh, these last maybe four of these that we can talk about, because these are really important foundations. And then you'll see mm-hmm. when we talk about what's wrong with panentheism, you'll see how they contradict so many of these non-communicable attributes of God. So let's talk about God's Absolutely. immensity. So we really talk about him being present as spirit everywhere and not as a body. And we will later on see that this is actually really important to understand about his nature. Yeah. And this is related to his omnipresence, right? That that Mm -hmm. he's in space, but he doesn't exist as space. He doesn't take up space, right? Yes. Yes. And that's Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. And uh, his omniscience, of course, let's let's talk about that. Yeah, so God knows everything about the future, the past, and everything that is to know. Uh, so he has an exhaustive knowledge of absolutely everything that we don't share, of course, with God. Right, and that one's more commonly understood, I think, by by more Christians. And then finally, his holiness. Mm-hmm. I mean, this God's holiness, we have yeah, to understand this important. if we're going to understand his nature. He's without any sin, right? And he is completely set apart from from creation in that sense. That's really it. That's really what it means to be holy, to be set apart. We on the, on on the contrary side, uh, we have a sin nature and are corrupt in a way that he is not at all. He's perfectly blameless and without any evil and sin. Right. Yes. Okay. So that was your primer, everybody, on classical theism and the attributes of God. So now that we've laid that foundation, let's get into the beliefs of Richard Rohr and Kenneth Copeland. So you're kind of uh, you're the resident Kenneth Copeland expert here, and um, <laughs> yeah. and so and I'll I'll represent the Rohr view of things. But let's start with creation. We talked about creation ex nihilo that God created everything out of nothing. What does Kenneth Copeland in particular say about creation, and um, w- what could we call his view. Well, I want to tell you about our next sponsor today, and that is Good Ranchers. Oh, I love Good Ranchers. I love having all of this American-grown and harvested grass-fed beef, better than organic chicken, just waiting for me in my freezer to pull out And I don't have to think too hard, but I know that I'm feeding my family high-quality, nutritious meat that isn't shot full of antibiotics. They're not shot full of growth hormones and all of that unnatural stuff. Now, if you're like me, you're seeing your grocery bill go 
up. Just today, I went to the grocery store and I just picked out a few things to supplement a salad I was going to make and a few other items. And it was almost $100. I could not believe how much prices have gone up and they continue to go up. Here's one great advantage of signing up for Good Ranchers today is that you will lock in your price for the life of your subscription. So whatever box you choose, if you subscribe, that price will never go up. It will never change. So you are guarding yourself against that inflation. Another great reason to subscribe to Good Ranchers today, especially if you're still listening to this in the month of April, is that if you sign up today, I think today is the last day, you're going to get free bacon for a year. This is heritage breed pork wonderful bacon. You get $240 worth of bacon for an entire year, but you have to sign up here in the month of April for that. Uh, so if you want to enjoy the highest quality meat in America, I can assure you that is true from personal experience. Use the code ALISA. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use the code ALISA for $20 off your first box. Don't forget, you get your free year of bacon, and you lock in that price for the life of your subscription. Honestly, that's the that's the highlight for me is that I know those prices aren't going to be going up. So we love Good Ranchers and our family. I I want all of my listeners to support them. They're a, a Christian company, Good Biblical Values. Just love Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use the code ELISA for $20 off your first box. That's GoodRanchers.com. Use the code ELISA. Yeah, it's actually very interesting um, if you study his creation beliefs because Kenneth Copeland is mainly famous for being a prosperity uh, preacher or teacher, which means he has a certain emphasis on things like, you know, seed faith and positive confession and health and wealth. But uh, it's surprising to find out that he also has very interesting uh, erroneous beliefs about creation itself. And he expresses that in his book, The Blessing of the Lord, which is basically his biblical theology. So he gives us a big picture view of the Bible uh, and what he believes about every aspect of redemption and creation. And here he writes in the second, second chapter, um, he's, he writes, when God said, light be, he did more than ignite the Big Bang that would set the universe in motion. Now, here comes the important part. He says, he released the very essence of himself into this material creation because he wanted the family he was about to create to be eternally surrounded with 100% absolute good. Mm. So now you see what he's doing here. Uh, he's claiming that creation is, in, in some sense, an extension uh, mm. of his own essence. So everything is formed out of divine essence. Mm -hmm. And we call this the creation ex Deo. So it's a creation out of God instead of a creation out of nothing, which obviously now leads to the, to the idea that creation itself has a divine quality. And yet God exists as a separate being. So he fulfills uh, the basic definition of panentheism with this statement. I'm not sure if he's aware of it, but right. he does so. Surprisingly. Yeah, no, that's really fascinating <laughs> because as you're reading that quote, I was thinking, now I wish we would have played a game like who said it, Richard Rohr or Kenneth Copeland, because yeah. the quote I'm about to read to you sounds almost like we're talking about the same thing. So this is from Richard Rohr's Universal Christ book, where he says uh, he calls God an infinite primal source. So he says this infinite mm -hmm. primal yep. source somehow poured itself itself into finite visible forms, creating everything from rocks to water, plants, organisms, animals, and human beings, everything that we see with our eyes. This self-disclosure of whomever you call God into physical creation was the first incarnation, the general term for any enfleshment of spirit, long before the personal second incarnations that Christians believe happened with Jesus. And as you can see, uh, there, there's this very panentheistic view of creation, creation ex mm -hmm. Deo. I am also want to play here a video for our audience of Richard Rohr talking about his view so you can hear it from him directly. Mm -hmm. The height of Christian seeing is to see God in everything. <laughs> to understand if God created all things, yes. there's one God who created all things, yes. then everything has to carry the divine DNA. Everything our eyes have ever seen is created in the image and likeness of God. And that God 
carries forth the God self into those beautiful blades of grass. Huh? So there's the view, right? Uh, now, tell me, Andreas, how does that compare to what uh, Kenneth Copeland is teaching? Yeah, so it, it seems like Richard Rohr has really the same foundational understanding of reality. So we see the divine uh, intrinsically in all that exists, right? It's, it's, it's literally a part of God's own being and DNA and essence. So that's mm -hmm. the, the starting point of their um, theology is the same. And I believe based on this erroneous starting point, we will later see uh, other erroneous beliefs that are built on it. So it's really, yes. it all starts with, with panentheism as the, the foundational idea about reality. Yeah, and it's really important to understand how important the doctrine of creation is here, because as we're going to see, this gets into all sorts of erroneous beliefs about who Jesus is or was, mm -hmm. you know, and what he claimed to be. Um, so, but let's start by talking about panentheism and why is it wrong? Because we've talked about God's omnipresence, the fact that, um, you know, he's not contained by space and he is spirit, so he's everywhere all at the same time. Some people might think, well, that sounds like what we're talking about with panentheism. God is everywhere, right? So what? But, but what's different about that and what's wrong with panentheism? Why is that such an unbiblical belief? Yes. So we as Christians, obviously, we do believe that God is close, right? And we, when we say close, we are talking about his imminence. But he's not close in the sense that his own essence is mixed or intermingled with the material world. That's mm -hmm. not the closeness that we as Christians believe in, but that's what they are promoting here. So that eventually uh, the, the imminence of God is uh, so strongly emphasized here that you lose God's transcendence, you know, his essence that is beyond space and time and the material world, and it's going to affect his essence and his attributes negatively because it's blurring the, the creator-creation uh, distinction. That's really a, a huge issue. Uh, let's think, of, for example, about God's immutability. Can it be upheld still in a panentheistic worldview consistently? I don't think so, because now God is beginning to change with the course of the events in the universe. They have a, an intrinsic impact on him, and they bring about a change in God's essence. You see, so uh, God's immutability doesn't exist anymore. It's not a perfection anymore. And this, moreover, has an impact on other attributes. If you think about simplicity, the idea that he cannot be divided, Obviously, if he extends his essence, there is already some form of a division where he creates things that are out of different parts. And then if there is also further changes happening in his essence, there would be parts that have to move to the side and, and so forth. So it's, it's not able to uphold uh, those perfections of God if he's so closely uh, connected to the material world, right? Mm -hmm. That's really the big danger. Right, right. So Kenneth Copeland also has a very interesting and a bit strange view of Adam. Tell us about his view of Adam as it relates to the doctrine of creation. Yes, absolutely. And I think his view of Adam just naturally flows from a panentheistic worldview. When, when everything is divine, eventually a human being has the same quality, right? And that's really what uh, Kenneth Copeland is promoting, again, in his book, um, the blessing of the Lord, he writes in the second chapter, in my spirit, I saw God standing up, holding Adam's body in front of him. The first thing I noticed was that they were the same size. Adam's form was just like God's, except it was limp and grayish looking. God's nose was right in front of Adam's nose. His mouth was level with Adam's. His eyes, looking into Adam's eyes, seem to be pouring into him everything God is. All his love, light, life, goodness, and mercy were being infused into this man. God was merging into Adam his very being. Now listen to this. 
The only difference between man and God was this. Unlike God, who is eternally sovereign and independent, man was dependent on God. In all other ways, God and man were so exactly alike that when the angels saw God and Adam together for the first time, they must have thought they were seeing double. Wow. This is a crazy statement. Yes. This is wrong in so many ways. I mean, now that we have studied God's essence and his attributes, we can even see more clearly how wrong that is. Not only the idea that uh, Adam is basically a copy of God, but uh, Copeland also implies that God himself is just like a human being, right? Yeah. Uh, somehow in, in a flesh and bones body, limited by space and time. But we saw now that's not true of God. He's beyond that. He's transcendent. He has certain attributes that we don't share at all, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that he's eternal, uh, the fact that he cannot be contained even in a temple. Uh, so that really doesn't fit uh, uh, the, the attributes of God that we just studied. Yeah, and it's it's like this deification of Adam. And what's interesting is, as I think about Rohr's work, uh, there is a deification of Adam in really all people. He goes about it from a different route. He, I don't think he—I mean, I don't know. I, it'd be interesting to see him hear that quote from Copeland, not knowing who it is, and say, do you agree with that? That would be an interesting question for Rohr. But I'll read you a, a few quotes from his work, and, and possibly it would help uh, our, our audience to understand at this point Rohr's main view of who, you know, what this Christ is. Because when Rohr is talking about the universal Christ, what he is doing is separating Jesus and Christ into two separate entities. And so Christ, when we, when we think about Rohr's view of creation, that God poured, you know, this primal spirit poured his essence into all created things, what he poured into them is this universal Christ, or even in the New Age, it's referred to as Christ consciousness. And so the Christ, in Rohr's view, is really the explanation of all reality. It's the logos for Rohr. It's the, um, the outpouring of God's spirit into created matter. So if you believe that you, every atom, every cell of your body is infused with this divine essence, well, then you're going to start to see yourself, your body as divine. And so in his view, when he's talking about Jesus sort of uh, maintain, you know, getting hold of this Christ consciousness, he even says at one point, I didn't write this quote down, but he talks about uh, Jesus being a model and an exemplar of the human and the divine fully operating in one person. And so he even, he never, as far as I can tell, outright denies the deity of Jesus in a unique sense, but he will say things like, you know, Jesus never asked to be worshipped. Our temptation is to worship the messenger. So here's a couple of quotes from Rohr about how, you know, you could get to the deification of Adam through this route, where he says, what if Christ is a name for the transcendent within everything in the universe? What if Christ is a name for the immense spaciousness of all true love? What if Christ refers to an infinite horizon that pulls us from within and pulls us forward to? What if Christ is another name for everything in its fullness? He says uh, in Universal Christ, the proof that you are a Christian is that you can see, is that you see Christ everywhere else. And also, this was kind of one of the more shocking quotes. Now, this is very interesting to me, Andreas. Uh, last night when I was preparing for this podcast, I was pulling quotes out of my Universal Christ book, which I have on my Kindle. So when people update their books, um, it will update on your Kindle with their new updates. Now, when I first mm -hmm. read Universal Christ, I read this dedication with my own eyes. I could not find it last night. So I don't know if there's a, I'm, I'm you know, it, to be as charitable as possible. Maybe it's a glitch. Maybe, maybe, but it is interesting to note that in my Kindle, this what I'm about to read to you is no longer there. So I had to go to our friend Doug Greutheis's review to pull this quote that he read when he reviewed Universal Christ. So this is the dedication, at least originally, that Rohr gave at the beginning of Universal Christ. Now, uh, with all the foundation we've laid, everybody just listen to this, and now you can understand where this is coming from. He said, I dedicate this book to my beloved 15-year-old Black Lab Venus, whom I had to release to God while beginning to write this book. Without any apology, 
lightweight theology, or fear of heresy, I can appropriately say that Venus was also Christ for me. So I don't know mm. if he got a lot of pushback and ended up taking that out for some reason, but that was in the original, right? And then I'll, I'll just read one final quote, and then we'll, we'll keep moving through this. This is Rohr. This is the great Christian leap of faith, which not everyone is willing to make. We daringly believe that God's presence was poured into a single human being, and he's talking about Jesus, so that humanity and divinity can be seen to be operating as one in him and therefore in us. But instead of saying that God came into the world through Jesus, maybe it would be better to say that Jesus came out of an already Christ-soaked world. So this is so problematic. I don't even know where to start. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I think it, Christ is a separate being. And what happens with this type of a worldview is that we destroy the individual. We are not mm. all part of the same essence. Yeah. That's just crazy. And it's not true. Uh, Christ, Christ is a separate external person. And we, even we, the both of us, we are separate persons, right? We don't have uh, the exact same essence in that sense. So it, it destroys individuality and it destroys uh, the personhood of Christ, really. Right. And actually, Rohr in Universal Christ, he talks about looking out into everything and seeing oneness. And he says how important mm -hmm. that is. And again, I hope our audience is catching how important it is to, to pay attention to words like these, because when we talk about God being distinct from his creation, when mm -hmm. we see the world as being one, as everything, you and me are one, yeah. we're one with the trees, we're one with the rocks, mm -hmm. that violates that cre creation, uh, creator distinction and makes mm -hmm. God a part of his of His creation, which is very, very bad news for theology. Mm -hmm. So um, let's, let's move again through Copeland's theology. So his deification of Adam and that view of creation, what would be his view of the fall? Of course, when we talk about Christian theology, about Adam and Eve choosing to rebel against God, and then Romans telling us that through one man, sin entered the world, and uh, mm -hmm. through him, sin and death spread to all men. What is Copeland's view on the fall? I mean, he certainly does agree that there is a great change happening, right? So in his understanding, it is more like that the human being then uh, basically begins to possess a sat satanic nature. And he runs into another interesting problem uh, because you all know one of the snake's temptation was that you will be like God. So if you eat of that fruit, it's a good thing because you will be like God, which would mm -hmm. imply, no, they don't have this divine quality. And uh, Copeland himself, he knows this problem, uh, this problem that he runs into in the early chapters of Genesis. So he has to really find a way around it. And that's what he's, he's writing here again in his book, The Blessing of the Lord, chapter 2. Uh, this is how Adam should have responded to the snake's temptation, okay? Uh, Adam should have laughed in his, that is Satan's face, when he told them that God didn't want him to be like him. He should have said, hey, we are already like God. Haven't you heard? He made mm -hmm. us in his image. What you're doing is trying to make us like you, and you can forget that business because we're not interested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he has to twist yeah. This whole, the fall narrative, basically. And you also see, again, the way he understands the image of God, uh, as if that means we are a, a literal copy of it. And that's another uh, misunderstanding. Uh, the image of God, uh, by various theologians, has described more of something like, okay, there is a moral capacity in human beings, or maybe even the creation mandate to, to rule is part of the image of God. Now, I personally, uh, from the maybe the perspective more of a systematic theology, and we just talked about the attributes, uh, some of the attributes of God are communicable, right? We mm -hmm. express that on a human level. I think uh, maybe in the image of God, what we can also find are these communicable attributes then. But it doesn't go to the degree that we are a literal copy and consist of a divine essence. And yeah or in that mm -hmm. sense, divine. That is certainly uh, heretical, actually, absolutely yeah. false. So what does Copeland teach happened when Adam and Eve ate the fruit? What, like when he preaches the gospel, 
How mm-hmm. does he how does he handle the you know the sinfulness of man and the atonement and maybe even what originally happened at the fall? Yeah, there's really an exchange of the human nature with the satanic nature. So it is a a little bit a more radical viewpoint than we who would say, okay, our nature is corrupted by sin, right? So we, uh, in us, uh, the sin principle is continually at work ever since the fall. I think uh, Copeland pushes that into more of an extreme here. What we can also see, I think the next step, as we think of his uh, theology building um, basically, basically anthropology on the idea of a panentheism, the next step he does, he gives human beings like um, the special power, you know, the, the authority of the believer, uh, the fact that they can f- confess things into existence. It's really based on this type of a very high anthropology. So you see mm. how he stepwise goes into error. He bu- he's building up everything on panentheism, then the deification of man, and then giving man this power and authority as the next level. Mm. This is so fascinating because, again, when I think about Rohr's view of the fall and, you know, Rohr is going to deny the doctrine of original sin as it's classically yeah. expressed. He'll even, yeah. he'll kind of capitulate to it in the book by saying, hey, it might have been helpful for a time, but, you know, it's it's not helpful anymore. In fact, one of the chapters in Universal Christ is called uh, Original Goodness, and there's a subhead yes. in that chapter that says original goodness, not original sin. And mm-hmm. so this is actually quite common in progressive Christianity. In fact, I would say it's nearly universal. Of course, course, progressive Christianity is a bit fluid. There's different beliefs that fall under that umbrella. But for the most part, there is a denial of the idea that humans are inherently sinful. And uh, mm-hmm. and so, of course, Rohr, sometimes people will say, call it original blessing. He calls it original goodness. And it's very interesting yeah. because he's he's commenting in Universal Christ on 1 John 2.21, which says, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Now, he's commenting on that passage, and here's what he says that John Mm -hmm. is talking about. So this is Roar now. He says, he, meaning John, is talking about an implanted knowing in each of us, an inner mirror, if you will. Today, now, you know, we might think of that as he's going to say, you'll see. He says, Roar says, today, many would just call it consciousness. And poets Mm -hmm. and musicians might call it the soul. The prophet Jeremiah Mm -hmm. would call it the law written in your heart, while Mm -hmm. Christians would call it the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, here's where he says his view. He says, for me, these terms, soul, consciousness, indwelling Holy Spirit, are largely interchangeable. Oh, okay. So he's confusing certain principles. Yeah, so he's basically saying, yeah, he's saying that your consciousness— Mm-hmm. is the law of God written on your heart. So you ha- you already have all of this truth in you. You just need to access because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, which is the same thing as your soul. It's the same thing as your consciousness. Interesting. Yeah. yeah and he says approaching the same theme from different backgrounds and expectations. But I want to just, you know, I want to swing around to First John 2, 21, because mm-hmm. here's what is so ironic and absolutely fascinating about his comment here, is the context of First John chapter 2 is he saying, mm-hmm. first of all, he says, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. And he's trying to help That's Christians right. understand, like, when you do sin, here's you have an advocate, here's what's going on. But then there's this section where he's actually telling Christians how to spot the Antichrist spirit, how to spot Antichrist mm-hmm. in the world. So I'm going to read now. Now, remember, <laughs> Rohr plucked verse 21 I write to you not because you know the truth, but because you know it and no lie is of the truth. But let's read the whole paragraph that that's in context with. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, Mm -hmm. meaning apostates, that it might become plain that they are not of us, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. Now, he's specifically talking to Christians, not all of humanity here. 
You have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie mm-hmm. is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, who denies mm-hmm. the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. It is so fascinating to me that he's taking a mm-hmm. passage that actually— identifies him as a false teacher for you know yeah. bringing this sort of antichrist spirit in and saying that That's this right. is the verse we use to say that your consciousness or your soul is the same thing as the indwelling holy spirit yeah and oh yeah comment on that please I mean, for it, us it, it's yeah uh, so a few things that i can hear out and correct me if i'm wrong but first of all uh, yes John implies that there is an ongoing sin principle in us, and it re- requires continual asking for forgiveness to keep the parental relationship with God and to cleanse our conscience. So those are uh, separate things. Uh, the other thing, if I remember correctly from First John, he is referring to certain false teachers uh, that promoted an early form of Gnosticism, basically. That's right. right. Those were the ones who basically went out. I think they t- taught something uh, similar to maybe a hyper grace doctrine where you don't have to ask for forgiveness anymore. And he considered that to be false teaching. So I, I think in the in the immediate historical context of what John is writing, he's refuting a lot of things that Richard Rohr seems to assume in his theology. Mm. Isn't right? Well, so my understanding of the proto-Gnosticism that for, that John mm-hmm. was addressing in 1 John, uh, you know, Gnostics are all over the map. There's different sects, of course, but yeah. for the most part, that proto-Gnosticism was denying that physical like gnostics thought that that matter was bad it was sort of this type of dualism right. yes. that taught that you know that that physical matter is bad and so the the effect that would have on people who were uh in engaging with christian theology they were saying well if matter is bad then yep. Christ can't be human or Christ would be bad or evil. Mm-hmm. And so they were denying that that Jesus had come in the flesh. And that's right. um, that's, that's yeah, so he was that's he was boosted. dealing with this this sort of um you know proto Gnosticism that it wasn't mm-hmm. fully realized yet. Um and and so I think they even believed in in one stream of Gnosticism that there were these different emanations of deity and the particular yeah. deity that created the earth was evil and wicked. So therefore everything he created was wicked and evil. And so, yeah. you know, how could you say that Christ come in the flesh? And that's my understanding of, of that immediate context. Yes, and, and I agree on, on your observations, absolutely. That's the other aspect of this early form of Gnosticism that John is identifying here clearly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so ultimately, um, you know, panentheism. Now, there are some, some scripture passages that people will use to try and make a case for panentheism. I've even had people come into my comment sections, and maybe, you know, with the time we have left, we might be able to get through a couple of these, but I'd love to ask Mm -hmm. your opinion, um, because a lot of times people will defend panentheism with Scripture, and they will use verses like Ephesians 4, 6, which says, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so, you know, how how is this being taken out of context to defend panentheism? I think this verse, if I remember the context correctly, is is referring to he is in all of the believers, right? Uh, so the the, the third person of the Trinity is indwelling the believers. The in all is not a universal statement that that includes all of creation. So that's mm-hmm. I think that's that one, right? Yes, that is. And that's actually, this is a typical, I don't know how Copeland would handle mm-hmm. this, but a typical Roar yeah. um, tactic that he, he will do. He's doing the same types of things. He's yes. taking all the in Christ statements in such a universal way and also yes. in, in a way to say that there is an essential connection and not just a dependency, right? That's where they go off. Yes, yes. And so Roar will say, actually, that he will, his tactic that he'll do is he'll take a a passage that was written Mm -hmm. directly to Christians, to believers, to people who are already in Christ, and he'll apply them to all mankind. And then people can get tripped up. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And so, um, 
you know, maybe another verse that people will use is Colossians 1, 16 and 17, which says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones mm-hmm. or dominions or rulers or authorities, all mm-hmm. things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This one is used all the time. What are some thoughts on that one? Yeah, so in him, it all holds together. The in him doesn't have to be taken as, again, a, an intrinsic connection between the essence of God and creation. It communicates the dependency of all creation on God, so that we as Christians believe, actually, again, that God is the foundation of reality. If God ceased to exist, the rest would cease to exist as well. Again, it's the dependency of creation, of all of creation on God that is meant to be communicated here. Yeah, and actually, if we if we appeal to our non-communicable attributes that we started the mm-hmm. episode with, this is actually making a strong case for that. All things, in other words, he is the prime mover. He is the cause. Yes the first yeah. cause of everything. Mm-hmm. And if he removed his hand, uh, you know, w- we would not exist except yeah. by his first move, his his primary cause that he's, I'm probably not wording that with philosophical sophistication, but it's important that we understand that, that he's not moved upon, he is the one doing the moving. And so all That's things right. are in him and, and rely on him and are mm-hmm. in him. So, um, okay. So as we come to a close here, let's just some final thoughts. I, I think what, mm-hmm. what I've really seen, there's some commonalities as far as the landing places of somebody mm-hmm. like a Richard Rohr and a Kenneth Copeland. They might get to those yeah. landing places from different directions, but there tends mm-hmm. to be a similar taking passages out of context by applying passages written to Christians as applying to all mankind. There seems to be a very erroneous view of creation where it all begins yeah. that sort of lands them in similar places. What are what are some of your final observations? Y- yeah, here? again, uh, I agree. Um, again, the basic reality is the same that they establish, panentheism. So the overemphasis of God's imminence. And based on that, they then create uh, some form of a very high anthropology. In Rohr's case, I think it's mostly like the denial of original sin and things like that. And his focus maybe even on positive thinking, uh, this type of an outlook on the positive, right? Mm -hmm. Um, With... um, with Kenneth Copeland, it's more like he wants to then, his high anthropology is, again, to, to give human beings a certain type of authority and power, uh, the mm-hmm. power of words and those things that he builds upon it. So you see the starting point is similar. Uh, again, uh, imminence, strong imminence, uh, overemphasized, high anthropology. And from that, they go off in, in different directions, but equally wrong. Mm-hmm. That's what I see. Yeah, and it's kind of like, I think you described this to me in an email when we were preparing for this podcast, Mm -hmm. and I think this is maybe the takeaway for everybody, is that classical theism, a properly understood uh, theology of God, knowing what his Mm -hmm. attributes are, we're starting with God, and then we learn who we are flowing out of that, whereas what we're kind of seeing with these other uh, theologies from Copeland and from Rohr is that starting with man. We're starting with who we are, and then we're going to yes. superimpose God onto that. And that is yeah. not a good way to do theology. We have to start with God. Yeah. So what really happens is at that point, you elevate man. He becomes deity and God becomes creature. Suddenly you reverse everything. Yeah. If you don't start from the top down in your theology, that's where you will ultimately end up really. Any final words for our audience of encouragement or bless or, you know, exhortation, whatever you might want to say? Yes, I think the takeaway again should be uh, remember that the Bible is a God centered book. So it's all about Him. Start your theology Mm -hmm. by doing theology proper right. Understand God's essence, His attributes the right way. And also, in a practical way, I can tell you to study that, to study God's attributes and his being, it's going to increase your worship. Mm, It's going to increase your worship. You will see, hey, I have to submit to this holy God. I have to turn away from from my sin. I'm dependent on him. So you see yourself in, in, in the right relationship to reality, how it really is, as you understand God the right way, leading to right worship, basically. That's what I can see from from all of our study, basically. 
So good. Great word to end on. I want to thank my guest, Andreas Viget. I did my best to pronounce that properly. Um, you guys, if you want to go deeper into topics like these, I cannot recommend Southern Evangelical Seminary high enough. Uh, they're a sponsor of this podcast. I'm currently a student at SES learning so much. I love studying the nature of God. And it does, as Andreas said, it increases my worship. When I come to God, even just to express my worship to Him, it deepens it on so many levels. Go to ses.edu slash If you're looking for some higher education, maybe you want to get a master's degree, a PhD, go to ses.edu. Recommend them so highly. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, click subscribe, click the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. If you're listening on audio platforms, always helps if you rate and review the podcast, uh, gets it into the news feeds of more people. Of course, if you see this go by on social media, click like, leave a comment, share it on your own social media. It helps so much. And as we pursue Christ, let's always remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time.